Hello, it's Scott Manley here with episode 19 of Xenonauts. We are still fighting the aliens, but our forces are literally being stretched to the limit. Thankfully, we are about to get some technological reinforcement in the form of the Shrike dropship. A, uh, well, it's a new spacecraft, or rather aircraft, designed to transport troops that is uh, derived from alien technology designed by our good old Dr. Snidely. I'm not sure that's his official name, but that's the name that I've decided to give him. So first of all, we need to get some logistical, uh, well, we need to relocate this aircraft to a spare hangar. That means that we will now have room to send the dropship over, and look at that, it's gigantic boxiness of magnificence, or magnificent boxiness, I don't know. Y you know what they say about flying as well as the box it came in? Well, the Shrike could contain a copy of itself. Um, yeah, I don't know, it, it, it's powered by alien technology so it can hover its way around with troops and things inside. Oh yes, base upgrade. Having covered our scientific exploits and unlocking the secrets of the alien base in my last report, this covers the resulting improvements of our own facilities. The greatest improvements have been seen in our laboratories and workshops. Both structures allow scientists and engineers to work almost 50% more efficiently than before. Our new biological computers and instruments mean that my team are no longer entirely reliant on our own ample brain power, and have been able to fully automate several formerly time-consuming tasks, giving us more time to think. I have also up had our upgraded laboratory soundproofed, allowing the brilliant minds among us to work without being disturbed by those less brilliant. There have also been a number of less obvious improvements in our base. For example, the refit of the kitchens and with laser-based ovens capable of cooking food in mere seconds, or the upgraded recreational areas with holographic entertainment consoles. Both of these have proved immensely popular, but unfortunately the replacement showers and living quarters with vastly superior alien gel sacks proved less popular. Events culminated in an incident with some of your soldiers, le leading to the upgrade being postponed postponed for now, but I hope you will discipline your men accordingly. Finally, we have developed an internal network that tracks all our systems together. Finally, we have developed an internal network that links all our systems together, whether in the same facility or not. This morning, we were able to transmit a mildly amusing image of a cat halfway across the world, suggesting it will be an excellent tool for sharing classified information within our organization. I named this impressive creation the Internetwork and would be very surprised if it did not catch on. Okay, now we have new stuff to research, and I think the assault shield seems like a good idea. An evolution of the combat shield using hardened alien materials to produce a shield that is more resistant to alien plasma fire. Because we all know how much the aliens love to share their plasma fire with our troops. Thank you, Dr. Snidely, that will be all. And there's my Shrike dropship moving across the planet. Of course, every time I see anything called Shrike, I can't help but think of the, the character in EVE Online. The uh, Band of Brothers, or former Band of Brothers leader, who uh, holds the record for the most Titans lost in combat. He's managed to lose five of them over the years. I hope mine are more resistant to getting shot down by hostile fire. So yeah, moving everyone in Charlie team into Team Shrike. And uh, yeah, actually, what I want to do is have the scout car at the front. So you can relocate your troops within the vehicle, except that there's not much room. So I have to kind of do this shifty thing to put it facing the right way. There we go. And then I can adjust my troops. And of course, I have to find room for two more troops as well to make sure that I can fully exploit my ground teams. And finally, my uh, old Charlie, I've melted down and I'm now going to use that cache to help me build a Corsair interceptor over in the Caribbean. It, as I said, it's my, uh, it's my manufacturing facility for aircraft and hopefully it'll help us deal with aliens. And speaking of the devil, we have UFOs. We have UFOs everywhere. So we do like we've done before, like we've drilled, like we've practiced. We send the Foxtrots out against some targets. We send Condors out against ever, uh, others. Anything that's within range is fair game. And now, ooh, UFO 114. Large 
cruiser. It's on a terror mission with civilians and harridans. It's traveling west at 2400 kilometers per hour at 16 kilometers. This this is important. I, I want to take... This is a new class, so I want to absolutely get this thing, shoot it down. Okay, so I'm going to take the Foxtrots and I'm going to send them after UFO 114 instead because it's absolutely important we take this down. Meanwhile, over in the east there, we don't care about that. We'll, we'll t shoot it down when... Nope, no, we don't want to do that. Turn around, run away, wait until you get a good approach vector. You do not want to go head to head with those heavy fighters. Hopefully the Corsairs will be able to do that once they are ready. Okay, now, okay, we have three Condors against a single heavy fighter flying over Europe. We should be able to auto resolve this. Brilliant, and we have ammunition left. We could probably select a new target, right? Select new target, and there's a. This is a. Well, this is a target rich environment. We have a small, medium, and a large. Yes, okay, we got some alenium and some alien alloys from that heavy fighter. Okay, UFO 14 has been intercepted, but I want to make sure I tail the target because we do not know what the fire zones are. Condor group is chasing the small one and we're tailing the bomber till it's over land and of course now we come straight up the middle and uh, yeah we apparently have Foxtrot 6 has forgotten to fire his weapons come on slow down a little come on yes there missiles away thank you uh, yes confusing 4 and 6 there but ultimately we got the missiles off and we are out of there Squadron 2 is engaging the tailed UFO, so, okay, good news is that this cruiser does not have a gun pointing out of its butt, because otherwise that would probably cause some serious trouble for my Foxtrot. So we're just gonna fly up behind it and make sure we deposit missiles and then run away! Okay, there we go. Initiate GTFO maneuver right now. UFO is hot. UFO, UFO is still alive. Uh oh. Okay, so we're gonna need some extra help here. I'm not sure the Foxtrots. Uh, the Foxtrots are clearly starting to show their age too. Not only do we have those heavy fighters, which are quite brutal, but we now have ships that require more firepower that I can deliver with even these alenium enhanced warheads. Okay, so Condor Group has intercepted the UFO and shot it down, more or less over France by the looks of things. That is a crash site which we're not that interested in, but we see UFO 114 flying around. It's supposedly on a terror mission. If it lands, I will be very unhappy. Okay, so now we have the Foxtrot 2 and 5 once again back in the air. Foxtrot 2 and 5 engaging from behind. And same drill as before, we're going to fly straight up its tailpipe and drop those missiles. Bug out before they can turn and hit us. Come on! Missiles locked, missiles away, bug out, initiate GTFO, and... Impact takes it down! Okay, two waves of Foxtrots is what it takes to shoot down this cruiser. And we have a nice crash site over Europe. So we are going to send, we're not going to airstrike it, there's too much valuable stuff there. But the airspace does seem a little hot, so we're going to wait. Okay, now we're going to send the Shrike out. It's going to head there extra fast, but I'm going to abandon this mission temporarily. I'm not letting them go. What I'm going to do is patrol and wait for daylight, because I don't want to attack the site at night. Oh! Situation stable, zero continents lost, but Australasia has cut its funding almost in half. We've lost a bit of money in the Middle East and Central America, but we have 700,000. That is a pretty good number. And you know what that means? That means it's time to start... Uh, I think we're, it's time for us to build a base in Australia. We're only going to need a small one. We'll just put on a regular radar system and, you know, some hangars maybe. Okay, we'll have to wait for that. The important thing is we want to have something there that will alert us if we have a base. Okay, but we're still waiting. How much fuel do we have? 81% fuel. That means that Shrike can pretty much just stay there and uh, spin his ship. Shrike was always very good at spinning ships, I would imagine, since, uh, you know, EVE Online. Um, ship spinning and all that. It's a, 
it's a meme. Oh hey, we've got the Assault Shield. The Assault Shield is a direct upgrade of the Combat Shield, employing our new knowledge of hardened alien alloys to create a tactical shield with much improved durability. It functions in the same way as the predecessor, soaking up much of the incoming damage from targets in front of the user. The vastly improved ballistic and thermal resistance of hardened alien alloys make them much more effective at stopping alien damage. As fabricating a rectangle is not a difficult task, the main point of debate was over whether the, we should design a lighter and less cumbersome shield, or leave the weight unchanged and greatly increase protection. Discussion with your men, and women, hey, revealed they had an overwhelming preference for the latter, and given the brief life expectancy of your breaching soldiers, I was inclined to agree with them. The assault shield should be able to withstand several direct hits from most alien plasma weapons before failing, hopefully enough to get the user through the mission without serious injury. The assault shield does of course fill one of your soldiers hands. Unable to wield two hand weapons they will be forced to use a pistol. You should also be aware that our shields do not provide complete protection. There is always a small chance that the lucky shot will hit an exposed body part. Okay, yeah, he needs to be taught about men versus women I think. Okay, Dr. Snidely, I'd like you to look into... This, the electroshock great grenade will help us against androns. Uh, might be a good idea, but uh, Haradin will help us against the oh, the Scimitar battlefield support tank utilizing advanced alien materials and electronics, intended to be significantly more durable than our Hunter Scout cards. Given that I've been using the Hunter, I think the Scimitar tank is the way for me to go. Okay, Dr. Snidely, inform your men that this is their next and most important project. And we return to Shrike in its pre-dawn holding pattern. The hostiles that had landed launched and we are going to deal with them, but we have a mission! Those communication signals are back, Commander. I suspect there is an alien leader in the area, exactly the type of creature we need to interrogate. Please do your best to capture it so we can continue our research. I would imagine it will be recognizable from its headgear in the same manner as the officer. Yes, well you would, he'd probably be recognizable by his bigger guns. So immediately you'll notice that I completely forgot that this has a front door and a back door and most of my men are actually pointing the wrong way. And we immediately encounter a civilian out here. So uh, well, assault it with maximum firepower. Luna Kier brings the, yes, brings the scatter laser to work. Suppresses the target, Carol Wilson. Uh, prepare some more firepower. Oh, misses. Who else do we have? We have Max Goldberg with his sniper skills shooting over the fence and doing some damage, but still it is alive. Willie Morgan bring his shotgun or laser shotgun and shooting down the civilian. Okay, so we continue our deployment and we sight another civilian. Luna Kier is standing round the corner, but thankfully uh, the hostile doesn't see her and shoots instead at my newly enhanced uh, shield trooper. Of course, uh, Luna then steps out and introduces herself with a hail of laser fire. Over at the farmhouse, Carol Wilson sights another hostile civilian. Move within engagement range to make sure we can do as much damage as possible, then take a step out into cover. Carol Wilson delivers a burst, and uh, Dana Rushnushnikova uses the old me and Bakken point blank laser technique. You'll also notice that she actually has the new assault shield. Ooh, wait a second, that is pretty epic. Oh, grenade! Grenade! What the heck? And we've got some serious firepower. Oh my god, we're taking serious firepower for some from off the map there. I'm not sure we can repel firepower of this magnitude. Okay, yeah, so Dana with her new improved shield, which was apparently mailed to her in flight since we didn't have the technology when we took off. Griffin comes around and uh, does the shotgun thing, running away. Carol Wilson comes from a different angle and let me see. Does it hit? No, totally fails. There is something off the map with some serious, like, heavy firepower. Ajnal Safar is coming in as reinforcements. They'd prefer a little more because they're taking serious fire, but that tank can't really get through this area. 
A griffin coming up and doing the point blank shotgun thing. Uh, yeah, brilliant. No, just needs to move back into cover. And Dana moves also into cover there. Now we need to find out who's got those super heavy plasma guns and is uh, blowing up those hedges because, you know, honestly, I like these hedges. I, I'm a shrubbery kind of guy. Oh, it's a hunter. It's a civilian right there. And that didn't quite work. Okay. Well, um, yeah, everybody come around because there are hostiles in this direction and we need you to make sure you can deliver your firepower unto them. Max Goldberg getting ready to snipe around the corner. Mika Noah Noak is coming up with his shield. And the hostiles are now laying into my scout car. Uh, thankfully, plasma guns are kind of hard to aim. Well, I'm not sure if that's a plasma gun, but that is a pretty epically powerful weapon. Of course, I have my own epically powerful weapon that will reduce you to not much more than a red mist. Oh, look, there's another one that has failed to die. But Lieutenant Luna Kier empties the rest of her laser clip into the target. Okay, so after some clearing up, it's time for us to actually start heading into the UFO. This is a cruiser, new floor plan, we don't know what is where. But it looks like uh, there's these little rooms on each side with a door that we can check out. So we'll send the crew in this way. Nobody here, nobody there. We're ready to go in and through the middle. No hostiles sighted, but we do have some epic amount of smoke here. This could be bad because, of course, the civilians, we all know, don't have any problems with smoke. They can see right through it. And nobody in this area. This is where the teleporters are, so we should probably deploy our team to these locations. Unfortunately, the scout car isn't going to be that useful anymore because we can't really move it into this particular area. As usual, we have to perform the final assault using ground troops alone, although it would be pretty awesome if we could actually teleport the, the whole uh, hunter into the bridge of the spacecraft. That would be pretty neat. Anyway, we line everyone up guarding these teleporters in case an alien should come down. So what I do notice is I change their position so their guns don't uh, cro they won't hit everyone else. Which is good, because guess who pays us a visit and regrets it instantly. I'm sure he was actually coming down to surrender, but uh, yeah, bad timing. We have those kind of itchy trigger fingers and all that. Wow, and the top floor of this is an epic mess. I'm not even sure that the alien leader is alive anymore. We don't have any real-time updates on this. So we have three doors here. I try to move my troops into position to cover all of them, ideally. I'm uh, not sure. I mean, of course, this is dangerous doing this because it's entirely possible that you will get an alien that will throw a grenade at you. So, But um, it really seems to be the best thing to do is to go in and prepare because they can only... They, if they don't know you're there, then they're less likely to be able to throw the, the grenade and kill all your men. So, got everyone in position almost. Lined up and... Uh, yeah, let's see what happens, what the aliens do. Nothing! So now we open the door, and I think that is the leader there, the guy wearing the giant... It looks like red armor or something, but it could also be like a bear pelt or something. So we want to capture this dude alive, right? We can kill the other one, but we absolutely want to capture the leader alive. The less we have to do to deal with the leaders, the better things are going to be. So that's one civilian down. These are officer-grade civilians, I'm pretty sure. Maybe they're guard. I don't know. They're, they're the tough guys. They're going to have grenades. They're going to have good weapons. Switching my shield people over to using the cattle prods because, of course, cattle prods will help us take this thing down. We're still throwing the grenades. Every, uh... Every uh, stun grenade puts more gas in and that causes more stun damage to these targets. And that hostile may be in cover, but uh, that cover is being broken down bit by bit. Willie Morgan still has plenty of shots in his shotgun. Dana is switching over to cattle prod. She's obviously going for the prize, because whoever whoever hits the final blow against this uh, alien officer, alien leader, gets to call shot. Oh no! Hajinal getting hit by a grenade, and... Oh, did we put him down? Did we kill him with reaction fire? Hajinal, you gotta heal yourself. Okay. Actually, no, I think the alien leader is still alive, because I see two... I see two... Um, 
red things. Two alien sightings, so that the alien leader is still alive there, despite being shot several times by most of my people. Okay, Griffin, finish him off. Thank you. Do what you do best. Okay, now, Dana, take a step in and start with the, start with the beat down. Alien leader, this is what we think of you and your alien leaderness. Oh, brilliant. Excellent. So yeah, Dana gets to call shotgun on the way home and is re uh, promoted to lieutenant. We get a cruiser data core, a civilian leader, and uh, yeah, we'll do some research on that and it'll no doubt provide more exposition of the story in future episodes. Until then, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.